so I'm sure you'll all agree that 2021, uh, it wasn't great. And uh, I, my kind of composer buddies fell into two camps. The, the ones that had, were working on productions that the, uh, they'd managed to finish just before lockdown and they, therefore were uh, able to continue with post-production and those who hadn't. I fell into the latter camp, unfortunately. <laughs> but by the end of the year, we, we saw the reopening of cinemas, Dune, James Bond, which was very exciting. And um, uh, the English speaking world was introduced to the wonders of Korean uh, TV in the, in the shape of Squid Game. So we'll have a little look back, but also a little look forward to trends that we've been observing and things we think that may happen in the year before us. Over to you, Paul. Well, I just, first of all, um, I'd like to introduce everyone. So obviously Christian, um, Christian Henson, my business partner and a good friend from Spitfire Audio. Um, Christian's a film composer, video games, lots and lots of, of that kind of good stuff. But we've got two fantastic guests as well. Chris Bowers, who won't be uh, an unfamiliar name to many of you will have seen at least one of his many films this year, <laughs> Chris. Um, people will know you from your amazing work on obviously Bridgerton, um, Mrs. America, When They See Us, the Madden NFL Games franchise. But last year, your output was phenomenal. We, I think we've counted up that you're fe you have featured on no less than 12 projects in 2021, which is an extraordinary one a month Right, and that's, that includes four feature-length films. That's incredible. Have we got our numbers right? Is that correct? You know, I, I actually don't even know. I, I didn't even uh, <laughs> count, but uh, it's also so tough you because- didn't have, You didn't have time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Too busy to count. Yeah, yeah. but uh, you know, some of them last for so long that like some of them have been in the works for the last couple of years. They just happen to all come out at the same time, but yeah. yeah really wow. Well, that's that's incredible, and um, and we also have the fantastic Emily Bear. It's great to have you here as well, Emily. And um, again, you know, I, I think the introduction, the best introduction, would be um, what your mentor Quincy Jones says of you, which is yeah. Emily has a unique ability to seamlessly transition from classical to jazz, from bebop to bossa nova, blues to classical, to popular music. Her potential is truly endless. Wow, that's pretty cool, isn't it? I just, I can't live up to that hype. <laughs> it's just too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, when it's come from Quincy, I think that's, I think you can just go, you can just nod sagely you know and, I'll just, I'll and take just it. accept. I'll take it and run. <laughs> <laughs> so, and and Emily, this year you've, um, you've, you've recorded this incredible um, musical based on Bridgerton and uh, it's, it's extraordinary. I, how did that come about? Um, well, I think I was definitely also in the latter, where 2020 as a year was terrible. Um, and it was like right in the middle of lockdown, like the worst part of it, the holidays had just happened. Everyone felt very disconnected. Everyone was getting sick. This is when LA was like a nightmare. And uh, Bridgerton had just taken over the world, including a fabulous score by Chris Bowers. And it consumed everyone and everything and like it just people were enveloped in this world including me and my writing partner abigail uh we are quite literally the target audience and um we write musical theater together and there was nothing there was nothing going on and we just started writing this hypothetical musical on tiktok for fun it was like a very small idea that kind of just snowballed and i think we were just so excited to to have something to do and like something that sparked our love for writing music again in like a very dark time um that we just kept going and now a year later it's like it's out and now we're writing a bunch of other musicals and it's it's great it was it was a really cool experience so chris tell us a little bit about your 2021 yeah, I mean, it's, I feel like the last couple of years have just been one, like, smushed together, like, long month. I don't really even know yeah. where 2020 ends and 2021 starts for me. But, you know, a lot of it was just kind of uh, seeing these, the fruits of a lot of uh, labor kind of coming to fruition, you know, like, 
Emily said, I think the top of 2021 was, you know, the response to Bridgerton just because it came out in Christmas of 2020. And and also a lot of that score is, is Spitfire strings just because we recorded all of that in, in the lockdown. So, you know, most of what we did was record um, uh, string quintet and have them layer themselves and then mix that with with Spitfire, uh, mostly symphonic strings, some some chamber strings. And then, um, and yeah, the, all the rest was just kind of people laying themselves. But um, but I guess with that, it was like also finishing um, uh, Space Jam, which was pretty crazy to, to score that in the middle of still being in the pandemic and figuring out how to do that. Uh, we, we were able to do it in uh, the studio and go to Warner Brothers to record it, but it was um, uh, definitely a very different experience, you know, having everybody striped and having woodwinds where each woodwind player is like 12 feet apart and, and you know, yeah. having to play that Carl Stalling type music with that separation was really a challenge, but I was really fortunate to have, you know, the best musicians in LA playing it. So I, I'm really happy with how that turned out. And um, uh, the Aretha Franklin film, Respect, that was meant to come out actually in August the previous year, and it got pushed, not even because of the pandemic, I think, just because they wanted to have a bit more time. And so that also came out in 2021. And, um, uh, and then King Richard, I think, was another, you know, pretty, amazing thing to be able to work on during that time and that i really started uh and right after i finished space jam and and um worked on that through the summer of 2021 and what's really wild about that is actually um you know i had such a personal connection to that film because of my parents and what they did for me and and how much my dad was actually literally inspired by richard williams in terms of what he wanted to uh, uh plan for my life and plan for my career. Um, but then uh, actually a week after I finished recording, I found out my wife was pregnant and we're oh, expecting wow. a daughter. And so and congratulations. Of, yeah, thank you. So, uh, you know, a lot of the rest of 2021 was kind of adjusting to that. And um, my wife and I just moved into a house and doing a lot of nesting and things like that. So, you know, it was nice to, to have uh, a lot of personal, um, uh, beautiful things to, to focus on in the midst of a lot of this, you know, chaos in our world, for sure. Yeah. It's yeah. such wonderful news, Chris. A friend of ours, uh, Paul, has a name for uh, 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 babies kind of born and conceived around this time, and that is coronials. <laughs> I, I, I've done some uh, socially distanced um, orchestral sessions, and... Um, uh, one of the real difficulties we've had is timing. Um, so I'm I'm getting it to like the, I've worked done a couple in air studios, and we have literally say that the far first violin is kind of behind the conductor, and then the the the, the back of the basses or or the basses are where the tuba would be, and they're just not used to that that kind of distance. So there's yeah. a lot of kind of reinterpretation of. Of, of timing because you know it, it, it travels so slowly doesn't it you know in um in, in those large spaces yeah i'm scoring my uh my first feature right now which is very exciting for netflix and i'm about to step into the whole uh covid recording space and i'm like oh my god i don't even i don't even know what to expect and how to deal with this but i mean it's all a learning curve so just figure it out. Oh, every 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 day is a school day, and I'm I feel very positive for 2022. I think that also because we know everyone's finished Netflix, Apple TV, they're kind of going content. So um, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna we're, we're gonna be busy. Um, I was wondering, Paul, did you uh, spot any kind of big composer trends of 2021? Well, I've been trying to think about this, and there are two things that I've kind of noticed, and I'd be interested to see what um, what you all think about this as well. But I think there's been two things. So one is the use of vocals. Maybe I've just noticed it this year because it, because I'm surprised that I'm hearing a lot of vocals on yeah. scores. Um, but also the kind of the, with the 80s seem to be coming back, and um, and I think that that is in a sense because i i love the um ghostbusters film that came out this year um went to see that during one of the gaps in you know when we were actually allowed to go to the to the <laughs> cinema to the theater um and and saw ghostbusters afterlife with the kids and i really loved the kind of the kind of calling back to the elmer bernstein score of you know of the 80s and it occurred to me that there's 
there's quite a lot more jazz or at least a more interesting harmony creeping into film music at the moment i i think i don't know whether maybe i've just started noticing it because i'm just a lot more interested in it this year than i was last year but what what do you think about that yeah for me i definitely um think the vocal thing is an interesting um observation i definitely noticed that as well i was thinking about that with even um i, I guess it was the end of 2021 so the yellow jacket score is something that i kind of immediately came to mind with their usage of vocals um i also feel like jazz i feel like has been this thing that's been rising for the last few years especially with like soul and and the success of a lot of uh, uh projects like that or even mank the score that trend atticus did for that was super jazz inspired um I, i've also really noticed this um it's something that it feels like it's been happening for a while, but it's even more present now is uh, artists that are from outside of the traditional spaces scoring films and and giving the being given the space to write really, really adventurous and um, uh, uh, unique scores. Thinking about like Zola, that score for Zola was like one of the craziest scores I've, I've ever heard from Mika Levy and... Um, Obviously, with Johnny Greenwood with Spencer and and Power of the Dog. I just love yeah. the minimalist approach that I feel like a lot of these um, composers are, are approaching their scores with. And then also James Samuel with with The Heart of They Fall. Like the the blend between score and song in that was one of my favorites um, in a long time. Uh, so I feel like you know this embracing of of pop music or or um, pop is a, is a to me like a reductive word for what these musicians are able to do, but I feel like they come from this space outside of the trad traditional scoring space and then are given the space to write a score however they would. And, and because of that, we have these really, really unique scores on these huge, you know, Oscar listed films. And I feel like that's that's something that's really exciting for me. Yeah. Yeah. Like so niche too. Um, mm. Obviously we've seen a lot of musical theater come back this year. Um, and also it's very like region specific like the Encantos and the Lucas and the In the Heights. Um, but I think it's really exciting. And uh, oh, and the new uh, West Side Story, but that's also not really. Oh, yes. Cool. But it, so just sounded, well. it sounded so good with those arrangements and Janine Tesori and all of that. Ugh. Um, yeah. I don't know. I just feel like it's always so project specific. And like you have the big like very textural, almost sound design -y scores that are obviously very popular. But also you hear like the traditional, more melodic orchestral scores coming back with like Spider-Man Giacchino and and Durham with the Klaus family and No Time to Die. I mean, and Despla with the French Dispatch, but then you have June, Dune, Dune, and Johnny Greenwood and like all of that stuff. I don't know. And then I feel like the, the scores like White Lotus and Squid Game kind of combine that textural sound design stuff with very like recognizable hummable melodic things oh there were a lot of vocals in white lotus too right like a lot it was really yeah. cool i thought that was really dope I'm a big fan. i had a very funny email from hans zimmer um because i live in scotland um, <laughs> asking if i knew any bagpipe players and i i set him up with some bagpipe players and I didn't realize it was for June and he booked 30 of them. <laughs> I spoke to the, I spoke to the recording engineer. He said it was literally like living in hell. <laughs> because yeah, you know, with bagpipe troops, there's one guy, one guy who tunes all of the drones. So can you imagine with 30 and so they're all rubbing and then eventually it goes thump, and it all just goes into a single tone. Um, absolutely nuts it's so cool. yeah yeah no i mean i mean what i love about the johnny greenwoods and and you know with hands he just keeps on doing it is is they challenge the paradigm the zeitgeist and they help bring our profession craft art form along which i i really welcome absolutely and um yeah i mean I, something that i, I i'm going to really start recommending people do is is when you're pitching ideas to potential uh, clients is to is to is to suggest what you would really like to do because by doing that uh, you're you're bringing your own ambitions artistically 
to the table as opposed to getting the director to kind of guess what he thinks you should do and brief you. And I got commissioned this year for something that I can't believe how cheesy they're allowing me to be. Um, but I said, I'd just like to be really cheesy. And they went, that sounds fun. <laughs> um, so I, I think it's really interesting to see how, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I, I feel that there's, it, our industry kind of flexes between a singular, everything sounds the same, to everything kind of breaking up, finding its feet, and then coming together and sounding the same a bit. And we feel like in one of those very interesting experimental kind of phases at the moment. I'm not hearing many ostinatos <laughs> on stuff, except for maybe like, you know, MasterChef and stuff. Um, MasterChef uh, and really... British Baking Show. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's just like, it sounds like scenes out of Apocalypse Now and it's like, <laughs> I burnt the creme brulee. Um, I think a great example of that is Nicholas Brattel's score for Don't Look Up, where he yeah. kind of challenged all of the tropes and where you'd imagine it to go big, he went small and beautiful and melodic. There's some jazz influences in there. And I'm just, it's quite interesting to see people kind of experimenting and finding their feet because there was this kind of singular thing for about five years that everyone was doing. I, I tell you, that's really interesting. And Chris and Emily, are, do you find that, um, I, I wonder if part of the freedom that is there at the moment is because of the explosion of content that's being created by Netflix, which has a different kind of commissioning structure or, you know, it's not kind of the old school, if you know what I mean. And I just wonder whether that's part of the influence on, do it, do you find that you get more creative freedom from Netflix commissions as as opposed to the, you know, the kind of studio system or the kind of more old school? I, I think it really comes down to, I think in a way, yes, because it really comes down to the filmmakers. And, and a lot of those spaces are giving opportunities to filmmakers that don't have to adhere to tropes or to, to um, uh, you know, the way that something is. I feel like a lot of these uh, streaming platforms are really excited about championing filmmakers that are trying to do something a, a bit different. And also the fact that there's this really competitive landscape that's been created yeah. with all of these streaming platforms trying to outdo one another that then, you know, as soon as you have a squid game that's really successful and, and a white lotus that's really successful, then I feel like it makes these other uh, uh, streaming platforms want to try to find their version of that or something that feels like it's, uh, like Christian said, breaking the paradigm. And I feel like a lot of that's filmmakers and with studios, you know, they, there's a bit more safety that that's involved. I mean, it's really interesting mm -hmm. to talk to filmmaker friends of mine who are younger filmmakers that are given an opportunity to, to work on a huge project. And there are times where they're given the freedom to kind of approach that in however way they would, they would do that. But then, there are also times I've heard from young filmmakers where they're hired to to bring a unique spin on something, and then that kind of makes the the people with with you know that are concerned about the money essentially nervous, and then all of a sudden they get pushed out of the the post production process where they're not allowed to really have their hands on making something that's really unique. So you know I feel like it's in any time that it seems like the studio or the streaming service or whatever entity that that's kind of commissioning it, uh, whenever they are uh, really excited about giving a filmmaker an opportunity to do something in whatever way they want to do it, he or she is looking to do it. I feel like that's when you, we have these really exciting things that come up and, and musically that, that trickles down to the score where you see uh, really unique scores. You see them hiring composers that have never scored something or, you know, are just kind of getting into it. And I feel like that's when we have really exciting voices. You know? Yeah. I mean, I've also been on the other side of things for the first time this year because I started pitching some ideas. Um, like, so there's this movie musical that Abigail and I pitched. And I mean, we're developing that from the ground up, which is very exciting, but it's also very different because like, I'm on the other side of it now. And it's very interesting to see the process and what people respond to and what makes them feel nervous about whatever the direction is. And like, obviously music is a very big part of our discussion. And I just, I think it's so project-based. I th I, one, one observation I made, I'm, I'm doing a big series for a, a big streamer. And because these companies 
often are tech companies. There's a culture of NDAs. So what's happening is you're not getting the focus group culture. Yeah. It's all being made behind closed doors. So it's a lot more reliance, reliant on trusted voices, opinions. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm getting for it. Just a little bit, Paul, like when, when you do computer games, it tends to, it, it's, it's less about fan service, it's less about mainstreaming and, and more about the, the kind of the collective opinion of the people you're working with. Yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. I, I heard something yesterday on, um, I was listening to a podcast on the BBC Sounds app and um, there was they were talking about research uh, that showed that that um, kind of having a group of people all you know coming up with an idea together in a kind of focus group slash brainstorming session um, almost never produces successful ideas and successful ideas are almost always produced by either a single person or you know just one or two or maybe three people all working on something together but usually one person coming up with a great idea so that that's interesting because that does you know that's that's I guess the scientific research bears that out. <laughs> so so Paul, I'm going to ask you this one um, because uh, uh, us Brits are a lot lot better at being grumpy. Um, <laughs> is there something that really you disliked that you saw a trend in scores last year, whether it be on TV or film? Do you know what the funny thing is that because the because the quality of a lot of the things that I was watching was so high. And actually, funnily enough, not to embarrass you, Chris, but just to say that, that I was watching the Colin in black and white and the, the incredible, um, the creativeness and the, the inventiveness of the production, I found, I felt was matched in the, in the score. And that's just one example of of me going and seeing things, either seeing things in, in the theatre or seeing things on, you know, on the TV or on Netflix or whatever, and thinking, wow, this is amazing. This is like, you know, a kind of rebirth of, of you know, just so many different ideas coming out that the only things that really made me feel grumpy was when I heard something that was just a bit predictable and expected. And I'm not going to name any names. <laughs> no one, no one here. Um, but just, um, I, you know, if you're watching something and you think a lot of money's gone into this, you can see the production is is really high value. And then you just get some, you know, you just get some pedestrian score on it. And the thing is, I know that you can't really blame the composer because it's entirely possible that the composer came up with some incredible concept and it just or, got... Or the, the original composer was fired and they did it in a week. Exactly, yeah. And then you, And then it's like, well... You just get whatever can be played out, can be physically <laughs> played into the door. <laughs> so yeah, um, so I think I think the only the thing that I didn't like was lack of creativity. And mm -hmm. um, but but it's really in contrast to such an explosion of creativity. And and I think it, it's exactly what you were saying, Chris. It's but it's it's the fact that there are so many new voices who are who are being uh, you know who are being given the opportunity to to um to score really kind of big projects i think there's you know the the crossover between between kind of artists and composers you know in inverted commas has made such a really interesting difference yeah. this year well i've got a really long list of bugbears but I've, chris emily do you have any things that uh wound you up last year you know i i didn't hear anything that i particularly hated <laughs> um but it was also for me and i need to have a separate conversation with chris to figure out how you watch movies and score 12 projects a year but <laughs> this was like a record low year for me of like consuming content all across the board like tv film music like when i got my spotify wrapped i was like oh my god i like just did not listen to music this year um so i this was this was a particularly bad year for me and so that's that was on my new year's resolution is to consume more content because it was just how do you do it chris please tell me all your secrets <laughs> well, first, like my wife being an actress we kind of make it like our job to watch stuff and like you know we don't 
we literally don't watch like brainless TV unless like there's nothing new for us to watch. But usually yeah. if there's a new show, like I, I, every day I take a basically like on average, like two to three hour break uh, around dinner time to, to hang out with my wife. And like, it's usually pretty dedicated to watching something. I mean, we try to spend a bit of time just talking things like that, but we're so in love with, with um, TV and film that we usually watch something, especially like with the, the, um, uh, you know, Oscar season, like every night we were like, okay, well, what movie are we going to watch tonight? And, and we'd watch a movie and that was my break essentially. And, um, you know, I feel like the other thing with that is that I don't really have a list of things that bothered me because that time is so precious that I don't really yeah. waste it for anything that doesn't feel like it's worth the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Really a handful of like shows and movies. I can't even think of the names of that. We like started and got 10 minutes into We're like, we're not going to watch this. Like we don't have time to sit here and watch yeah. something we don't really feel moved by. And then, you know, that, that kind of like filters out the, the noise so that I feel like anything that comes to mind is actually something that I actually really enjoyed. And, and, uh, you know, I could maybe ask my wife because I feel like she's she's been, you know, on bed rest, sitting around watching a lot of content. So she's definitely any of those shows that I was like, I'm skipping this. I don't really want to watch this. She usually went and finished that that season, so I could ask her. <laughs> but yeah, I have a list. I did yeah. really enjoy Nathan Barr's The Great. I thought his score to that was wonderful. Oh, I didn't see that actually. It was oh know. my god, it was so good. I think it was my favorite show I saw this year. Oh, wow. Along those lines, Chris, uh, my wife and I have, have uh, set up a uh, vintage film night, Tuesdays. Oh. That's and, so fun. But it's also like there's some stuff. You know, I've always prided myself that I'm a, you know, I, I've watched a lot of films, but I saw Sunset Boulevard for the first time the other day. It's mind blowing. Oh. But also this weekend we watched uh, The Fog, John, John Carpenter. I'd never seen that before. Oh, I haven't seen that either, yeah. Uh, just mind-blowing. And I think that actually there's so much inspiration that could be drawn um, from, from these, these absolutely classic films. I was watching an interview with Spike Lee talking about the ten films that inspired him, and I'd only seen two, and I just really want to work... Like, I don't think I've ever seen a film by Fellini, which is just disgraceful. And I think there's probably stuff for us to to draw from that. Can I give you my list of three bugbears? Yes. Please. Yes. Oh, I Col Leno, Col Leno, just stop <laughs> it. They don't like it. Stop making people play like that. And I say that because I used, I don't know if any of you went into your doors earlier this year and there was no Col Leno. It's because I used everyone's <laughs> on a score. Um, uh, the second is what I have a real problem with is, is um, I don't mind when the aperture is small with a score and the images are big. I think a great example of that is uh, Michael Giacchino's first Star Trek movie, when this thing is exploding and he went small. I think a lot of the computer games are doing that. But what I don't like is when the aperture is too big and the scene is small. And I've seen a few things where you just go, too big, too big. I mean, uh, you know, you mentioned Bake Off and, and MasterChef, a prime example of that. Um, and then uh, for me, uh, just like talking about, you know, laziness and stuff i just do not understand why people don't use live musicians just one um i just there's never ever ever be, i mean i know this may seem odd coming from someone who develops samples <laughs> but there's just never ever a case i mean i know that there may be time but at least one there's surely a budget for one even if you buy them a pint and you pay them double next time yeah what it does to to music is just it, it, it's it's so important so i get very very tired when i actually to be honest when i hear st stuff that's like 100 percent spitfire and there is at least just one even the composer just picking up a recorder you know <laughs> so final question to you all um crystal ball what what stuff do you expect to see look forward to see you know, uh, imagine there'll be more of next year, maybe starting with you, Chris. Yeah, I feel excited to see more um, content that's led by musicians, you know, looking at uh, the, like a film like The Heart of They Fall, or, you know, I'm excited about like what Emily and Abigail are working on. I feel like uh, the, uh, so many 
musicians are already storytellers and, and approach their music making in that way. And, you know, a lot of my favorite artists uh, in terms of like artists that just make songs and, and records and things like that, their approach to music videos is incredibly cinematic and, and there's a lot of storytelling there. And so I'm excited for more of those kinds of artists to, um, to helm entire projects. I feel like we've had a lot of really cool things that have come from that. How about you, Emily? Uh, one of the big projects that we're developing, we're actually looking at this really incredible music video director to, to direct it because, mm. because it is musical theater, but we want it to be like a very kind of intimate experience. Um, mm. And they just, they know how to tell a story with a song. They really, they just do. Um, and I think like the fact that the studios are even interested in hiring a music video director who's never directed a short or anything in their entire life is very exciting. Um, and I'm excited to see which of my favorite producers and artists are now going to flip into scoring because I feel like everyone, like even from five years ago, scoring has gotten so much more mainstream and I'm so happy because I feel like it's such an undervalued art form and it's such a big part of our pop culture. Um, like I know Phineas, Billy's, Billy Eilish's brothers wanting to get into scoring and like there's this great songwriter that I work with who has written like hits for every big pop star who's like it's his dream to score and it's all the same it's all telling story through music and so it's just I feel like such a, a, a natural bridge anyways I'm excited to see that um and uh I'm really excited for Danny Elfman's new Dr. Strange <laughs> What about you, Paul? Um, I think there's, well, there's two things that I'm definitely looking forward to. Actually, can I make that three? Um, I'll be quick. So the first two are two uh, TV shows that are coming back soon here. Um, so the Ozark, which I think is probably the most terrifying. I'm sure that the score has something to do with that, but it's <laughs> one of the most terrifying uh, psychologically programs. I've, I've, I find myself having nightmares that I am actually in Ozark and one of the characters in Ozark. <laughs> So I'm kind of, with trepidation, I'm looking forward to that coming back. Um, and uh, Peaky Blinders and things, things that have these, this great kind of um, real kind of character to them and, and, and that kind of thing. But also, I love the, and like you're saying, Emily, I love the involvement of producers in scores. And uh, one of my favourite producers, uh, incredible talent, is Greg Wells. And I've just been... I've just been listening so much to the stuff that he's been doing. Um, and, you know, even, even going back to, uh, you know, Greatest Showman was just so inventive, such an incredible album. But the but in the Heights, I could, I've just been listening a lot to that lately. And, um, and so, uh, and I know that, you know, there are other producers who work on, you know, other more traditional scores. I know that um, Steve Lipson's worked with Hands as well for, you know, and so there is this, Kind of crossover happening, and I think that when you get that that bit in the in the middle of the kind of Venn diagram, you get this really interesting thing because you've got two incredibly creative powers that are kind of blending in this really interesting way and coming up with something that's that's really different than maybe either of them would, would have come up with originally. So, yeah, I had a um, I had a wonderful moment. Uh, I guess maybe a year or two ago, uh, my kids uh they're kind of they're now 13 to 9 there's three of them and um they were obviously into their screens and stuff and were just watching this utter crap yeah. on youtube like just watching other kids open presents but what upset me the most is the quality of the music was just appalling and you're just going oh my god it's like fast food for the the ears it's just horrific and then this thing came on the telly and it was amazing to watch art finding my children and they never from that moment from literally that first hour they never went back to those YouTubes and they they it developed this hunger for stuff that was fulfilling and that show's coming back and it was Stranger Things and yes I know they're way too, be, too young to be watching that but um, <laughs> I'm a terrible father um, yeah, music industry what can I say um, <laughs> You know, I just, I just think it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's wonderful. And for me, I think if, if there's anything streamers are proving, is this kind of dumbing down 
bullshit, let's face it, is just it just doesn't doesn't apply. I think Christopher Nolan proved that with Inception and stuff. And my little boy watched that the other day and it blew his mind. And so not only am I looking forward to the musical output, but the fact that we're, I think we're entering into a golden age where where the consumer gets to pick. It's not what's ever at their local um, cinema. I think the other thing I'm really looking forward to is I went and saw James Bond with my little boy and I came out feeling elated and I suddenly realised there is a place for cinema because neither of us looked at a screen for the best part of three hours. And that was refreshing. We were in the moment, we were together enjoying the same thing. That's honestly been the biggest thing for me is that I love going to the movie theater because you can't just start looking at your phone and going on Instagram and reading emails or whatever it is. Like you are in the movie, which is so great. And I just feel like and a it's... lot of these, like huge epic experiences are experiences and you have to experience them in a movie theater with the surround sound and everything and I don't know. I mean, you're not thinking about work. You're not thinking about all this kind of toxicity of Twitter and stuff. I, I see cinema being a major, major, you know, people go, oh, cinema's dead now. It's like, well, tell vinyl I, that. I go across <laughs> the street to my like movie theater in my neighborhood and it is packed every time. There's also just that, I feel like we're so sick of watching things in our own home. And there's that like magic special feeling that you get when you go to the movie theater and you smell the popcorn and you're like, all getting ready to watch and like there's a little murmur and then it starts and you're like oh my god it started i don't know it's just it's different it's like watching a streamed concert versus going to the real thing you can't can't uh remake it same with broadway but also with all of these different outlets of content we don't have those water cooler shared experiences and i think with cinema at least you have that with that group of people at that time yeah Please do tell us about what you're working on, if you're allowed to, Chris, what you're working on, Emily, that what you're looking forward to in, in your own output next year. Chris, maybe. Yeah, I'm um, trying to think of what uh, I'm working on um, uh, The Haunted Mansion with, with Justin Simeon uh, for Disney, which I'm excited by, and um, working on a couple of Marvel things I probably can't say much about, but I'm excited oh. about that, like entering the, <laughs> that universe, and um, uh, and and just finishing a, um, a DC comic show with uh, Ava DuVernay actually called um, DMZ for HBO, and that that is a really cool, like it's a four episode mini series, but uh, it stars Rosario Dawson and she's amazing in it. It's a really cool show. Yeah. What about you, Emily? <laughs> um, so like I, there's a few projects that we're developing that are really cool and exciting um, and like live in such different sonic worlds that it's very fun. Um, one's a, I don't even know if I'm supposed to say this. One's a, a movie with Mark Platt and then one's another movie, which is like our own idea that we're developing with Lucky Chap, um, which is exciting. And then uh, scoring my first feature, which is very exciting because this was fully on my dream board at the end of 2020. I was like, what do I want to accomplish in the next three years? Um, so it's exciting. Um, what else? Oh, there are a few other projects that we actually should be hearing about or back from this week that I'm really hoping for. One's a big Disney one, and it's all also always been a dream of mine to be a Disney songwriter. So um, wow, that would wow. be really cool. And then- there's there's another one that just like the script made me weep multiple times and I'm not like that. And I was like, oh my God. Um, so hopefully we'll hear back from those. I'm trying to think, is that it? That's it. Paul, I know you've been making lots of sounds, but you've yes. actually been pe penning something, haven't you? Yeah, you don't have to talk about it if you don't want to, but you have. <laughs> been penning something i have been penning yeah i had um i had a i started writing a book in 2006 this is the most delayed gratification i've ever <laughs> experienced <laughs> <laughs> and so i just i thought back to when i was um when i was in my early 20s um and so just yeah so that would have been you know the kind of night the mid 90s and there was no internet you know there was no youtube there was no 
there were no magazines about you know film music or anything like that and um and when you found when you wanted to find information about how do people do this how do people create film music you'd find the odd article maybe that had a picture of you know hands or someone sitting in their studio and and you'd sort of sit and look at it for ages trying to work out what gear they had and all this kind of stuff and i thought what i would have loved then is just a really straightforward book that kind of explained okay this is the business stuff that you need to know about just you know um concisely and clearly and then here is some creative stuff that's that might be interesting and might be inspirational and it's not like what you know what chords should you use what keys should you write in and all that kind of stuff it's just things it's about the creative process and the process of you know of of creating a piece of music from the very beginning to getting to the end and having the kind of mix at the end um and really kind of focused on music for media so, so cool. i finally uh covid kind of pushed me into finishing it <laughs> so i so i've uh, finished i've just finished writing that so just kind of you know spending the next kind of month putting the putting the final touches to it and all that kind of stuff and i'm really excited to see yeah to to see how hopefully if it helps one person <laughs> then uh, then it'll have been worth it I mean, that's so... I, I, I've, I've had a sneak peek and it's brilliant. So ah! um, that's really good. <laughs> um, uh, I, I moved to Scotland nearly six years ago and uh, I've just met this just incredible... I had no idea as an ignorant Englishman, the, the folk scene up here is just some of the most amazing musicians I've ever worked with. I found a new amazing orchestral recording space and the orchestras up here are great. So I'm working on a bunch of projects that's involving Scottish musicians and because of the amazing influx of, of, of need for studios in London, um, I'm hoping that people will come to Scotland to use it as overspill, but also these in incredible musicians. And I'm really excited for people to hear what's possible up here. Um, oh but the, for me, the reason for being a composer is to work with musicians and, um, and it's just extraordinary up here. So there we go. So um, thank you so much, Chris, Emily, Paul. It's always lovely to see you. I hope we can do this again soon, possibly in person. And as always with these videos, there's so much exciting stuff coming up. So do subscribe, ding that bell. And please, one of those for Emily and Chris and Paul. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you guys for having me. And Christian. Oh. Christian. <laughs> <laughs>